the background for, um, for the seminar that you could fish on the perfect day when it's cubby season, you could fish it inshore. When the trout are biting, you could take it to the Oriskany. You could go to the spur on, on a perfectly calm day. But we've got two boats that are considered coast, coastal boats, right? They're not bay boats. They're not a 26-foot Pathfinder. They're not a 25-foot Contender. They're not even a 27-foot CV. They're not, they're not bay boats. These are coastal boats. And I just wanted to put these boats as a background because a lot of people right now are looking for the Swiss Army knife, right? They want something that if the wind's blowing out of the south 15 miles an hour and there's three to fours, they don't want to go sit in the water and, and, and bottom fish during snapper season. But you know what they can do? They can launch their boat at, the, at Joe's Bayou or they can launch their boat at Legendary Marine and they can fish this shoreline and catch all the redfish and trout they want with very little wind at all because it's coming out of the south. And the trees help, right? The, everything blocks the wind. So it's, these are just very versatile boats at very different price points. So I would just ask before you guys leave tonight, just get up on the sales deck and just kind of walk around. Or you're welcome, to, you're welcome to board the boats, but just stand over the top of them and look down into them and look at the differences. And the one thing, well, there's a lot of things that they have in common, but the most important thing when we're cobia fishing, we need what? We need vantage point. We need height, right? And I mean, they're not the full pull, but they're better than sitting at a normal helm and trying to look down into the water that you're sitting in. And I, I've personally caught a lot of cobia out of bay boats or coastal boats. And these aren't, these aren't full towers, right? A full tower would be above the hardtop. These are called stand-through hardtop towers. So that means you're standing on the console that you're normally running in and you've just got a little bit more of a vantage point. You can, do, you can do a lot with a boat like this, okay? You can catch fish in the blue water that people don't think that you can catch fish in the blue water unless you're up in a big tower. But brown and blue and brown and green is still brown, right? Mm -hmm. You can still catch these fish and sight fish for them, but I just wanted to give you guys two opportunities as background and a quick, the cliff notes on this one you know what an Everglades is, Mark? Uh, that's why I stopped listening to you so I could look at it. <laughs> so Mark is an Everglades owner. He owns just the little brother to the 273. It's the 243. The, 20, the 273 is a twin engine, deeper side, deeper gunnels. It's, it, it, you know what's it, it's crazy about these boats is people look at them as bay boats, but they're not bay boats. They're not coastal boats. This is a hardcore center console. If you come look at the, the degree of dead rise at the entry, you look how much boat's in the water. This is a hardcore, this is the 45-foot Everglades built down to 27, and they just chopped the sides down to accommodate a trolling motor. That's what a coastal boat and a bay boat does. The reason you have a lower gunnel is so that it can still accommodate a trolling motor comfortably. You can still fish inshore. You're not sitting up on top of a 35-foot center console with a 96-inch trolling motor down to the water trying to catch trout out of three foot of water. This does all of it. Second station, twin engines, loaded out electronics. This is a really cool boat. This was just introduced this year. This is a 2023 model. And so this is called the 267 OE. OE means they have a master's version and they have an OE version. So when you stand on top of this, this is the same exact setup as you would see with their nice casting platform, but they eliminate the casting platform in this boat, in the Sportsman, and they give you the full walk around ability. You have a full fish boat, like a hardcore fish boat with the luxury of the coffin box, your fish box, with seating at an armrest. And even the armrest adjusts up and down so that you can slide in and out if you've had too much to eat, like me. All right, you have four live wells on this boat. You have two live wells in the corners, and those are called aquarium live wells that have a nice clear piece of plexiglass where you can see your bait. Then you have a center live well behind the lean post, and then you have a forward pitch well. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I was looking at it. 
So if, if Mark or Tim and I were standing up here throwing live bait, we had our power pole that we installed down in the water and we're just pitching docks. And we don't want to walk all the way to the back of the boat to get our live shrimp or live pilchards or whatever we're pitching. We just keep this open, drop a long, a long dip nut down there and then we have live bait. So it's just a really cool boat. And the one thing they can common is that during the spring you can cubby a fish. During the winter, you can run the beach, look for bull reds, pompano, all that good stuff. When you're running to Crab Island with your family, you can run the flats and you can look for the schools of trout and redfish that move out of specific grass flats so that when you're done with family day, the next morning you can come back and catch them early. It's just a, they're two awesome boats I just thought would be a great background for this seminar. And I know we're talking about mackerel as well, but I know the main focus is cobia. So. Once again, thank you for coming. I'm Todd with Legendary Marine, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over. Well, thanks, Todd. You're I'm, welcome. I'm Mark. This is, <laughs> this is Tim. Thanks for coming out, guys. Have a good night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There you go. That was short and sweet. Everybody learned something? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awful. But anyway, good evening. Thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, you know, Tonight, we are, our main focus is going to be cobia fishing, but, you know, we figured we'd throw a little bit of Spanish in there, too. We did Spanish for bay fishing last month, but during cobia season, you know, a lot of boats, well, I wouldn't say a lot of boats, the boats that were out today did very well Spanish fishing right outside the pass, and it's something that you can do while you're cobia fishing. You know, you're driving along looking for cobia as well. If you got some kids or something, you can sit back there and catch some Spanish while you're doing that. But uh, <clears throat> you know, when you know we talk about when is cobia season. You know, generally I've always you know the majority of the cobia season is the second and third week of April. But we start catching, we should start catching fish by the fifteenth of this month. Um, hopefully, you know we're going to talk about live eels later. Hopefully, we'll have live eels. Later on this week, uh, the first shipments kind of do in. They got some weather up in the northeast, so we're kind of playing it by ear because they get they get flown in. But um, we are going to have two Cobia tournaments back this year. We did, I don't think we've had any for the last couple of years, but Beauchamp's and uh, the Boathouse are both having a Cobia tournament back this year. Um, you know, and in the last couple of years, don't discount May and June for Cobia fishing. Not necessarily, and this is something we're going to touch on a fair amount tonight, I hope. Um, we caught more cobias last year chumming and bottom fishing than we did actually cobia fishing. Um, and that's become a very popular way. It's never been the Dustin way, um, but it has become a very popular way of catching them the last couple of years. You're right. I think uh, almost all of them came off of chumming for something else. Yeah. You know, a couple of these are just cool pictures. This was a whale shark that was offshore with about, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven cobies on them. Cobias love to be, they're, they're kind of, I have beagles. And beagles are pack dogs. Cobias are pack fish. They love to be with each other and they love to be with other things in the water. Um, you know, the big, one of the big things with cobia fishing is, is learning what to look for. You know, that's what a cobia actually, that's five, well, there's one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, and maybe one more back here in this pod right here. But generally speaking, we, more so than any time we see, we see cobias in either singles, triple, or singles, doubles, or triples. And then occasionally we get to have days like this. Those are the good days. You know, these are all, those are cobias on. Uh, so for me, if I, when, you know, I'm, everybody, we can argue about this a little bit. Um, between different cobia fishermen, but for me, 
you get to see a lot of people like to cobia your fish up on the sandbar because it is easier to see them up on the sandbar but for me i like to be off in the deeper water a little bit i think the fish that we find in the deeper water those fish have not been messed with as much they're much more likely to eat because everybody up on the bar can see them so well um, but we have a unique thing here we we have the best cobia fishing in the world when our cobia fishing is right and there's three dominant areas and that's from the El Matador condominium in Fort Walton to the Navarre Pier and then the Navarre Pier to Opal Beach and Opal Beach to Pensacola Beach and you could pick any one of them three areas if you just stuck to one of them you would be fine I think there's there's been more hundred pound fish caught in what we call the green tank and that's the that's the big water tank that's about halfway between Fort Walton and Navarre that general area right there is some of the best cobia fishing in the world um, that one's supposed to be much later because that one's chumming oh so here's what I was talking about earlier you know this is the sandbar right here and you'll see more boats fishing just on the edge of this sandbar than anywhere else because it's the easiest to see. But out here, just off the sandbar in a little bit deeper water, what most people don't like about that deeper water is when the fish is up on top and you see him, if you spook that fish and he goes down, he's much harder to refine. The fish up on the sandbar, he's real easy to refine because he's on the bottom, but I can see him on the bottom in this 12 feet of water, but out here in anywhere from 30 to 60 feet of water, I can't see him on the bottom. And it's learning what, how, if that fish goes down on you, how are we gonna refine him? So, and I can just look at this picture and tell that this, is, this boat's fishing to the east, is heading east. Well, if you ran up on a cobia right here and you spooked that fish, what you would wanna do is circle offshore, come down, get you know several hundred yards off the line that that fish was on come back down the beach and come back into that to the same depth of water you were fishing and then just stop and wait that it, and you need to go a quarter to a half a mile down the beach and that fish that fish or number of fishes will come back up on that same line you just got to give them time if you spin around real fast and try to find them sometimes you get lucky but most of the time it takes them a little while to melt back up to the surface I think the analogy or the phrase you used to say is if you go cobia fishing with meat, you'll see the sandbar twice, once when you cross it and once when you come back in. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of true with me. I don't really, you know, I'll, I'll fish up there if I have to, but I don't really like it up there on the sandbar. It is, it's super easy to see up there. Just another good example of how far off the bar that these... This happens to be the boat that's in the picture on these last two pictures is uh, probably, it's a, it's a boat here locally called the Full Pull. And I don't know the numbers, I'll get them wrong, but they're very hardcore about catching the first cobia every year. And I think something like 17 out of the last 24 years, they've caught the first cobia of the year every year. Um, they're very hardcore about it. And uh, I'm sure you'll get into it, but a question. What, on the last one, that boat was obviously fishing towards the east. Mm -hmm. Which way do you think these fish are going? So the fish are moving east to west. Um, and glare, this is a thing where we, we, when we're traditional cobia fishing, Glare is a big issue because we're going we're, we're fishing, you know, we're spot casting for these fish and very seldom if the conditions and everything are perfect, I will fish east, but in 85% of the time, I'm going to fish to the west of town. And the main reason for that is we can come out of the pass and run down to the El Matador condominium, the last condo in Fort Walton and then start fishing towards Pensacola. Well, we have the sun at our back and it's much easier to see with the sun at my back. And I'll fish all the way to Pensacola 
unless we start, now if we start finding fish, never drive by fish to catch fish. If you find three or four in a row, you catch one or two, you need to come back and refish that area. But on a typical day, if you, fit, if you start left Destin, you don't need to go cobia fishing early in the morning. You can leave here at eight o'clock because you need the sun to get up a little ways where there's some angle on the water and there's not so much glare. Well, you start fishing down there, you get to Pensacola, by that time it's about one o'clock, you're gonna spin around and start fishing home. You have the sun at your back the whole time. If you're gonna fish on the east side of town, you need to come out of the pass and probably run to Grayton Beach, fish back to Destin, then turn around, fish back to Grayton Beach, and then run home. That way you keep the glare at your back. And those fish are migrating to Louisiana to spawn, right? Right. Yeah. All the you know, all these fish are going, like Mark said, they're all going to Louisiana to spawn. And um, so there, the, you will occasionally find a fish that's moving west to east. Most of the time, that fish has been spooked by somebody, been hooked by somebody. Very rarely have I ever caught one that was going the wrong way dropped on the boat <laughs> and you know like Todd was talking about earlier you know the boats with towers you will see everything in cobia season people trying to get some advantage this little rig's a tiller steer rig I mean you see everything in cobia season then you didn't you post a whole thing on these that got like a quarter of a million views or something I did I, I have about I don't know, 50 or 60 of, the, of pictures very similar to this. And I did a post last spring, and it's turned out to be the biggest Facebook post I've ever had. It's over half a million views, and it was just a silly, ridiculous Facebook post. Of mostly stuff people in, uh, from Destin. Yeah. You know, this is uh, one of our local landscape this, this and fitness guys. He caught, you know, you can catch them off paddle boards, you can catch them off the pier. There's, there's a bunch of different ways to catch copious. And that picture is just way out of thing. We need that one later. So here's Mark, this is, this is your old boat, isn't it? Yep. Yep, so one of the things about cobia fishing preparedness is everything. Um, a lot of times, the re your react the full pull is I, I say that they're one of the best cobia boats that's ever been it's because those guys are the most prepared cobia fishermen i've ever seen when cobia season gets here they don't have to put line on the reel they don't have to tie a rig for the entire year they come in in december and january they buy leader they buy hooks they buy everything everything is pre-rigged i've never fished on a boat where the guys were more prepared than them but having your boat set up, like Mark has his to here, these, and on the, the sportsman up here, you see these, point those two black rod the, holders the out there. Those front facing rod holders. Cobia fishing, those are your two most important rod holders that you have on the boat. Because if you take, when you see a fish, we need to, I always say I like to have three people in the tower. I like to have a driver and someone fishing on either side. If you, have, if you have a big enough tower for that. And, but these two forward facing rods, I normally like to have eels on those or some sort of live bait. They'll be in a bucket down on the deck. And then normally I may have my jig rod actually behind me. But those two rods allow you, so when you're driving along and you see the fish, all you gotta do is slide the rod out, pick it up, and throw and never take your eyes off that fish. Um, if you don't have those in your boat, that's an easy retrofit. Like my boat didn't come with those, but a clamp on, on that rail, on that black powder coated rail across the top, I added, now I'm moving the angle forward, but nine times out of 10, I'll leave the angle just for an extra rod holder. But during cobia season, it's just one Allen screw to pop out, adjust it forward for that purpose. Yeah. And um, I think even on yours, you had to buy like two or three different sizes because you had different, 
Because you added a lot of rod holders to yours. I like to take a lot of rods. I don't like to have to cut and retie or when people get tangled or whatever. I think I at least 12, 13 rods every time I take the boat out. Yeah. Um, but that little setup is one of the things that will make a huge difference for you because you're ready to go when you see a fish. I'm sure you're gonna get into this, but talking about preparation and keeping the rods moving forward and driver drives and hat and sunglasses. Yeah, so you I think that's right, almost the next couple pictures. Um, but yes, when you have multiple people in the tower, like I said, I like to have three people up there. The driver's job is to drive. If you see fish, if the driver lets go of the steering wheel when, you, when you're really doing this right, you're going to mess up fish. Each person has to have a job. And, you know, if me and Mark and if Todd was here with us and he was over here and I'm driving, so Mark's first thing he's going to do, he's going to get a live eel out to the fish. If that doesn't work, the next person, they're going to get a live pinfish out. The next one's going to be a live mingo. The next one's going to be a live mullet. But everybody knowing their job and having multiple buckets around the boat with multiple baits ready to go is a huge thing. Um, uh, actually, in that picture, I remember that day. Mm -hmm. I know this is cobia and Spanish, and I don't yep. necessarily recommend this because I think if you do see a cobia, then there's too much going on. But in that picture, I was actually trolling two straw rigs off the back of the boat. Can you see them? Yep. I, one right there. One, uh, one right. No, that's got, no, a, that's that's got, got, my, that's got no. my jig on it. Look in the yeah. corner. The, they're in the back corners. May not. Yeah, can. right there. Yep. So I was oh, actually, yeah, it is. It's bent up. I it's was, actually got a fish on I it. I was trolling two straw rigs off the back while driving looking for cobia. We caught a whole bunch of Spanish, which was tough to scamper down and get that rod and bring it back in, but had I seen a cobia, I would have been real mad that I had all that stuff off the back, just in case. Yeah. But it is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, yeah, there's, there's some days that the cobia fishing is really good, but there's other days that it's not. And you, if you know, like Mark, he's out there on a charter, he's got to get, he's got to catch something, whether it's a cobia or Spanish or whatever, but he is going to have to catch something. Um, but you were, you, you were ready to talk about hat and sunglasses. So, like, for me, obviously sitting up top, I want to see. So I think the last time we cobia fished with you and LJ, yeah. right, I had the two probably best fishermen that I know on the boat, and all, I was like, you know what, I'm driving. You guys fish. I'll just, I'm just going to drive and look for them. So I was upstairs just looking. And I had, and very rarely do I wear a buff or anything to cover my face or anything like that. But on that day, having my hat forward with the wind blowing and driving the boat, I actually use a buff to hold my hat down. Uh, so I don't have to worry about the wind blowing it off. I'm too, it's too hot for a hood or anything like that. But a pair, of sun, a pair of good polarized sunglasses with a hat down low and my buff on, it's just kind of like a horse with blinders. It just makes it really easy to see. So I think that day we each had our area that we were looking. I mean, obviously I had a whole lot off the front. I was looking everywhere. You had a side, he had a side, and I think Kayla had the back. Yep. And I guess you'll get into all that stuff. But the, one of the most important things that I gained from going to his seminars five years ago was having a dark underside of your hat. So polarized sunglasses and a dark hat, because you'd be surprised at how much glare kicks off the boat. Yeah, and off something the... like that, that is very hard to see fish with something like that. And, and you guys have heard of brown spotting, but if you're upstairs and somebody's looking offshore and somebody's looking inshore, and then that per one guy looks offshore and looks back in, you'll swear you see five cobia, just from the glare and all that, that brown spotting. And I'm very bad at doing that myself. At the end of a long day cobia fishing, my eyes hurt. Um, you know, what do you need for cobia fishing as far as tackle? You know, most of the time, if we're doing an inshore seminar, bottom fishing seminar, trolling seminar, anything out there, 
we're probably talking about using braided, some sort of braided line. For cobia fishing, I am not a braid fan. Um, I'm still, this is something I'm very old school about. Um, and it's because I've lost, cobias do something that, that, first off, when we throw and we hook one, when you first hook, set the hook on a cobia, they just run real fast and then they stop. And then they, when they stop, then they do this little zip, zip, zip. And with braid, when they do that first little, when they do that first run and stop and they do the little zip, 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 I broke off more fish that way than, and I don't, it's just that the, the braid just doesn't have enough stretch like the old school, like good, you know, this is pink, 25 pound pink Andy. This is what I grew up here fishing with. Um, and to me, something, you know, anywhere from seven foot to, you know, I th most of the pier guys now use nine foot rods. Um, most of my stuff is still very traditional at, at eight foot. And these, and both of these rods are rods that I built when I was 14 years old, 15 years old, and I still fish with them today. Um, but, you know, heavy duty spinning, seven to nine feet, 25 to 30 pound mono, and a reel that will hold at least, you know, 250 to 300 yards. And Mark's looking at me like, that's so heavy. I saw you lost Kobe on that rod. Uh, I saw you lose one on that rod this year, but but you hooked it. So, with that said, I'm, I'm just picking on you. Oh, it, you know, I hear this. I, m most of our best cobia fishermen ever, they grew up pier fishing. Um, if you can learn to catch cobias on our pier, you can catch them anywhere. I think I'm really good at cobia fishing. And I hear these guys come in the store all the time and they're like, well, I've never lost one on a jig before. You've never hooked very many on a jig before because I think I'm really, really good at it. And I think my catch ratio is about 65%. <laughs> if you want to, if you want, if you, you know, we're, if we're tournament cobia fishing, we're not throwing jigs. I mean, I would rather catch a cobia on a jig than anything else because I think it's so cool you, to throw that jig out there. And, you know, jigging a cobia is real important, just like anything else. When the fish is coming here, if you throw this lure and you, if you're too close to him, he's not going to bite it. If it's too far from him, he's not going to bite it. If you reel it at him, he's not going to bite it. You've got to throw it past the fish and bring the lure to in such a manner that the lure is coming away from the fish. That's very natural. A bait fish runs from a predator. A bait fish doesn't run at them. But when we throw that jig, most people think about jigging for Spanish, and they're going to do this. Jigging for cobias is more, it's just a little flip of the rod. The jig's just doing this. I want the jig to stay right here in front of the fish. If the jig's up here and then down here and then up here, that's hard. Fish isn't going to eat it, but I would rather catch one. I, it's so cool when a cobia eats a jig. When you see them coming down the beach, their peck fins are going to be all kind of tucked in. And they're kind of moving along. And you throw that jig, and all of a sudden that fish he gets excited, and his peck fins pop out, and he starts doing this little number here. And you're working the jig, and he comes up to it, and all of a sudden. He'll kind of be following it, and you're working that jig along, and he'll turn upside down and do this number. When you see the white part of his belly, you can set the hook. You may not have felt him, but he has the, if he's, if he's bellied up on your jig, he has it in his mouth. But like I say, even the best of us are about 65%. Mark's little rig over there with a 7 knot Mutu light circle hook and a live bait, that's death to a cobia. That works every time. The last, that day with me, you, and LJ, I was upstairs just driving. I saw one swimming right at us. I took it out of gear and I yelled 11 o'clock 
and LJ grabbed, he had a big soft plastic and just launched it out. And I, I could have sworn it landed on that fish. And I was like, well, I was thinking that's, I was like, this is over. And then you pitched the jig out just a little past it and brought it right in front of it. And I saw him open and like, it's one of those things that you want to show a picture of or a video. But at the, if I'm driving, the very last thing I'm gonna do from the tower is be like, oh, and I'm, I, I can see it like it was yesterday. Um, but it's just one of, you're right, it's one of the coolest things there is to watch that. And it finally bit about where you're sitting. It was, that was awesome. But like I said, you know, but a, a seven aught owner Mutu light hook on a 60 pound mono leader with a live bait, that's almost foolproof. And the thing I like about it is if we have, if we have friends on board or clients or whatever that aren't very good at it, all, if they can pitch the live bait out there in front of the fish and that cobia will come up to the live bait and the eel tries to run away and the cobia goes down and I have watched the fish eat their bait and I'm like, okay, all I want y'all to do is let him have it for about two seconds and then close the bale and I'll, use the, and I'll do the rest with the boat. Just hold the rod. Don't do anything else. And just kind of drive off and that circle hook goes whoop and he's dead. You got it. The only thing, you know, um, my other live bait rig, I do like mullet. One of my favorite cobia baits is a mullet. And I've not had as, I'm a circle hook guy for almost, kind of like the braid thing. I'm a braid guy for almost everything. But for cobias, I'm a mono guy. And if I'm using a mullet for bait, I use a trouble. I use a two aught treble hook. Um, I have much better success with that. Oh, uh, you're free. And you'll notice that this rod does have braid on it. This rod is so soft that I feel like that I can fish braid on this one. This one is so stiff that I'll break a lot of fish off with braid on that one. If your rod is super, super soft on a live bait rod, I do think you can get away with it. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I was gonna say. I fish pretty light gear. So I think between having a pretty floppy rod and a drag set correctly, I think you can get away with where some of the, the stretch. So like my stretch, is, it's like, an, and I hate to say this because it comes off wrong, but I think women are, like the best anglers because their arms like guys when a fish pulls back a guy immediately is like no I'm pulls back twice as hard but a lot of times a woman her arms just kind of give the right like she still pulls but her arms just have the right or like, not I don't mean it like that maybe like a small guy too but the arms just give now you're the, trying to be politically correct I know now I feel uncomfortable because it's on the <laughs> internet um if I ever run for office or anything um no, but like the, your arms, like your arms kind of give and like good anglers, like you'll do it. Your, your arms will give, like, you know, when your drags like, oh, that doesn't feel right. And you'll give back at it and you'll point the rod and let them take it off the line. But some, but sometimes guys have a tendency to just yank back and it's between a, a softer rod, which I think you lose some casting distance. So I think I, I use a little bit shorter of a rod because I try to use the same rods for many different purposes. So if I don't see cobia and I have four people on the boat that want to catch something, all right, well, I'm not going to take five cobia rods out and then try to go snapper fishing with them. So I try to use the same, some type of rod that can handle just about everything. So I think the right rod with a braid and the drag set right, I can get away with it too. But if we're only cobia fishing, I do think you have an advantage. Um, so we kind of covered a lot of this, you know, hooks and braid and leader material. You know, for leader material, I like, you know, 60 pound fluorocarbon leaders. You can see on my rigs, most of my stuff is about 18 to 24 inch leaders. That's plenty. You do want a really good swivel on here. Um, Cobias fight really hard, and you're going to find that even the best of anglers will reel against the drag on a spinning reel and get a lot of line twist. 
make sure that after every one that you catch, that you cut this off, let a bunch of line out behind the boat, troll it for a couple minutes and reel the line back on, get the twist out. Because fighting a fish, the size and the power of the cobias that we get, you are going to get line twist. That line twist will cost you a fish sooner or later. Um, whether it's the line itself gets damaged. You know, when we have a live bait on these rigs, we're gonna have this, the little live bait's gonna be on here and he's gonna be either in the live well or in a bucket. And we gotta have a little bit of slack on there. Well, if you have line twist, that line goes bloop, and it wraps around the tip about three times. And you reel up and get ready to throw at that Kobe and go bloop, and throw the bait right off. Um, I noticed you tied on this one, you tied the line straight to the front of the jig. No loop knot or anything? I'd, I don't trust the loop knot. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. I mean, it's a granny, it's a granny to knot and then the line goes through and you tie another granny and I know uh, there's probably a couple of better knots, I don't know, but gosh, this doesn't look like a very, <laughs> I don't trust that at all. Well, Do you I, use that? I, I will on certain inshore circumstances yeah. for action on, a, on the lure but I think breaking strength and all that with the right knot, I, I do think there's a, a little bit of a better action yeah. on the jig with a, with a loop. Um, but I just, I, you know, I just, I just fly out, don't trust it. Um, and that's the truth. I mean, there's certain things that I'll do on the boat that I don't trust. And you're like, well, that works. They're better. That's how you have to do it. And I'm like, I had one of those break once. And I'm like, honestly, pink Yozuri, I bought a spool once. And I broke off every fish that I hooked on it. And Kayla actually bought it, bought me one that was like a 1,500 yard spool. I don't know how much she paid for it. I won't use it. It's just bad, bad luck on my boat. The clear one's fine, but the pink one. And I like, and I know I like the pink one better. So, whatever. You guys probably have something like that on your boat too. Um, but if you don't yet, you will. I mean, we, we, all have, we all have superstitions. Yeah, see, look, clear is fine. See, you guys? It is. I just like pink better. Um, as far as baits go, the, you know, a lot of times we're going to go snapper fishing or grouper fishing. We need cigar minnows and herring. We go cobia fishing. We need a multitude of baits because I, one of the funniest things I've ever seen a cobia do um, I was fishing with some buddies of mine. This would have been back in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, but um, uh, Mark and Jeff Yonora from here in town. And it was, this is long before any of us, we kind of had heard about eels, but we didn't know that much about eels. But we'd heard about it. Well, we're going down the beach one day, and we find this little Kobe. And he's not but about 30 or 35 pounds. Um, but he's cruising along and we're throwing at him. We've thrown jigs at him. We've thrown pinfish and mullet and mingos and cigar mints. We've thrown everything we've got at this thing, at this fish. And one of the last resorts is normally take the 60 pound leader off, tie a, tie a hook, just like on this rod here, that's tied straight to the 30 pound mono and a ball of squid. And a lot of times that will get you a bite. Now, you're probably only going to catch half those fish on straight 30 pound test with no leader, but I'd rather catch half than none. Well, we still can't catch this little cobia. Well, Jack's heard about this, that cobias eat eels. Well, sometime over the course of the winter, he had caught a couple octopus and he'd cut some octopus tentacles off. So he runs downstairs, gets an octopus tentacle, comes back up, hooks it on one of the live bait rigs, pitches it out there past the Kobe and he's just kind of working it along. He's kind of snaking this thing along the surface, trying to make it look live. And this little Kobe, it runs up to the eel or the um, octopus tentacle. It kind of sits there and he's, his peck fins are out now and he's looking at it, he's kind of doing this number. And then all of a sudden he spins around about three times around this octopus tentacle, pukes all over the top of the water and eats it. True story. Um, 
but we finally threw the right thing at that fish. We gave him something that he really wanted. So having bait variety. And that's um, not, I mean, for me, I grew up on the East Coast and I think, and I don't know what's later in the seminar, but I have strong opinions on where the cobia have gone that isn't backed by science yet because I don't have enough data for it, but I have a theory that I'll get into if anyone cares. But the long story short, it's El Nino, El Nino and La Nina. And I think a lot of the weather patterns moving across the country, and I, I track all that stuff because I'm a snow skier and I try to forecast storms in the winter that I can go ski. Um, but on the La Nina years, and from talking to you about which are good years and which are bad years and which were La Nina years and all that, there weren't good cobia years during certain weather patterns. However, where I grew up, we fished for stripers and, um, I mean, it's East Coast fish, but stripers love eel. So we always ate, I mean, not ate eel, but we always used eels for stripers. But, and big soft plastics that look like eels. Lately, all my buddies from back home are just hammering huge cobia in the Chesapeake Bay on live eel because it's what they were using to catch stripers. It's what they fed on. And I, I know that's, I'm digressing a lot, but not surprising at all because that's the only bait that they use. And that's why I still take those soft plastics on the boat here every day. And like Mark said, there's, I mean, cobia fishing, I, so, we're in a down, we're kind of in a down period on cobias right now. Um, but this is not the first time I've seen a down period on cobias and it's not the worst. Um, you know, we had great, the cobia fishing in the 60s and 70s. Um, I started pier fishing back in 68, 69, um, just as a little bitty guy. And all through the 70s and the early 80s, cobia fishing was phenomenal. And then we went through a period in the late 80s and we went through four or five years where we had really, really dirty water. Um, it was just never pretty and green. It was just kind of this dingy, red, muddy looking color. Um, and I don't know if we were having a lot of rains up north of us back then or not. I didn't track it as good as I should have. But then the 90s came around and the cobia fishing went back to being phenomenal and then the 2000s were okay, and now we're in a really kind of a down, back kind of like at the late 80s period. And I think it will come back, um, but it's, like Mark said, we got to get to a weather pattern change of some sort to, to kind of turn them around. And, and last year was interesting because watching the numbers, and I say this every time, like you can't, and it's good for some people and it's bad for some, but you can't catch a fish without posting it on Facebook. So with like, some of the guys are a little more particular about stuff, but when you watch the fish catches move up the, with the water temperature and all that move up the state of Florida, you can kind of see what's gonna happen. And last year and the year before, it was like kind of Miami moving up the East Coast side. People were like, Cobia, Cobia, Cobia. And I was like, oh man, like it seemed to me like the, it pushed them on the East Coast side. Yeah. And then fast forward to the middle of summer, my buddies are just, the Chesapeake Bay was full of them, which is fascinating. And I mean, the science behind the fish and how far they swim in their migration and all that, it's not uncommon for the same fish to go all the way up there. Yeah. You know, and, you know we all hate regulations, but Cobias are only regulated pretty much on a state level and not a federal level. And because they're not, until they regulate them federally, I don't think they're going to make a significant comeback either. Um, um, but, but baits. Loves, oh, baits, yes. You know, I'm sure everybody knows, but in case for anybody who's new and may not know, where do we catch bait around here? We got just up on the north side of the bridge we got the south channel here the tip of the jetties out by the can buoys and the lip of the pass you know you like i say you want to have a variety of baits when you go um hopefully i have these kind of in the right order but you know live eels now you can't catch those you have to buy those 
Eels are probably one, one of, if not the best cobia bait. Have you, you guys ever tried to pick up an eel a, and put it on a hook? Yeah, have it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, it's, you know, I, people come in the store all the time and I'm, you know, they're asking about eels or maybe they're just getting live shrimp for the day and that somebody else is getting eels and they're in a bucket and they're looking at them and going, what are those? Those, those live eels for Kobe fishing. Oh, and I'm, one of the guys will be like, give me $20 if you can pick one up. It's not the fact that the eel is going to hurt you. If you don't know how to get one, there is no, if they're in a bucket, you're not going to reach in the bucket and pick one up. I don't care what you do, it's not going to happen. Because the harder you squeeze them, then they make this little slime, and it just goes, whoop, and it's out of your hand. I don't know how you're still married, because, like, I get home, and I'm pretty gross at the end of the day, but Tim is definitely that guy who's like, oh, an eel, and he'll go. He's holding it like this, trying to get it. It's, like, over his neck somehow in the corner, and he's holding it. Well, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Not really, but you know, <laughs> not hooking in the eel is like riding a bull. You got eight seconds. When you dip him up with a net, you need to have a glove. I prefer a paper towel because the glove, I can just keep getting a new one. But you dip him up, you pick him, you grab him with a paper towel, and you have eight seconds. If you don't have him hooked in eight seconds, and it's a matter of hooking him in the right place. It's got to be right behind the scruff of the neck. Do we have a picture of one hooked up? I don't know. I'm trying to see where his. But, yeah, but right, there's two little peck fins. If the hook is on top of his head, they don't like it. If it's too far back, they'll tangle your rig up. It's that perfect little spot. You just barely, their skin's so tough, you just gotta barely prick the skin. As soon as you get him hooked, he's gonna go in a bucket. You need cold water. A lot of the guys say ice. A little ice. You know, 10% ice, 90% water. Not 90% ice and 10% water just to kind of let them chill out a little bit. But you get them in that bucket of water and they have to have slack. If they can't swim around that bucket freely, they are gonna take their tail and go up your leader and tie it in a knot and they're gonna go up again and tie it in a knot. When you finally see a Kobe, you reach over there to get, it's like, oh, no good. And then, and then you see one and you're like, all right, you have eight seconds to hook another one before we, before we lose them. And that's why, you know, it is gonna happen. You're, you, you're gonna, it's gonna happen. So that's why you need to have other baits ready to go. You know, you, Mark telling you that story about my wife and eels. I tell you the best story about my wife and eels. Eels will live in a cooler with an aerator. They're, they're fairly hardy. So long, if they get hot, they die. Well, um, my aerator had gone bad and we were going fishing the next morning and I, we wanted to leave you know, and I didn't want to have to go by the store because if I go to the store, I'm going to get trapped there for an hour. So I brought eels home. Well, they're in a Ziploc bag. Well, that, and so I just put them in a Ziploc bag with some water. There's about 12 or 15 eels in that bag, and I threw them in the refrigerator. They're fine. Well, the next morning, we have computer issues, so I have to go to the store anyway. So here I go to the store. Eels are in the refrigerator. Well, I get a phone call after I've been at work for about 10 minutes. My wife has opened the refrigerator door and the eels have kind of pushed on the bag so they're right at the edge of the shelf. So when she opens the refrigerator, the bag of eels falls onto the tile floor, burst open. Now there's 12 or 15 eels in my kitchen loose. I can hear the dogs in the background. They're barking. My wife's screaming. Tim's like, oh, I'm driving through a tunnel. Sorry. I think I'm losing you. So, yeah, been there, done that. Um, you know, other baits. Pinfish, excellent and easy oh, to hey, catch. Got a question? Yes, oh, sir. Yeah. Uh, an owner seven knot Mutu light circle hook. Yeah. There's only one bait that we'll get to that I use a treble hook for. Um, you know, Eels, number one bait. Pigfish, if I can have it, it's probably number two. Then pinfish. Squirrelfish are great. Croakers are great. And then mullet. Now, 
mullet are kind of a, to me, are, are a standalone. I said pigfish is number two. Well, mullet can be my number one go-to. Um, if we see, if we're, coat, if we're fun fishing, the first thing we're going to throw is a live eel because you're most likely going to get a bite. But just like with a jig, an eel has a tendency to ball up in a cobia's mouth sometimes, and we miss a few on eels. But if it's a tournament winning fish, if I look at that fish and go, that fish is going to win us the tournament if we catch it, well, I'm going to throw a live mullet at it. And normally, if it's going to be a tournament winning fish, it's a fish that's probably, it's over 70 pounds and it may be well over 100. So when I say a mullet, I mean a mullet, not a little finger mullet that we're going to throw at a child, mullet. One to two pounds. So big that I may have to have someone on the bow of the boat. You know, we're driving. We got the angler. Up, we got a driver. We got an angler in the tower that's holding the rod. And we got somebody else with a mullet. Okay, open the bale, and we th physically throw it at him. Um, it will get you a bite. If you take, and if you take that mullet, and you trim his tail, and you trim off one peck fin, he has no guidance system now. He has no, his only choice is no matter how hard he tries, he can't go down and he can't go, but whichever peck fin you cut off, you just cut off his rudder. So he can't go that way. He can only go the other way. So he's just gonna go in a circle right on top of the water and it just pisses the Kobe off. You know, cigar minnows are kind of down, you know, down my list. We did talk about squid earlier. A lot of times, just a squid on a hook with no leader, that will get you a bite when nothing else will. Yes, sir. Yeah. I only do it, with, I pretty much only do that with mullet. And only for cobia fishing. No. I don't know. I, I honestly, I should have tried it with other bait and fish, but I really never have. Mingo snappers are excellent cobia bait. If you're going to use mingos, make sure that they are of legal size. You know, um, it's perfectly legal to to harvest mingos that are legal size. Um, so if you are going to use them, they got to be legal. Where would you look at? A mingo? Yeah. I'd put a circle hook right through here. Questions before we kind of move on just a little bit? Yes, sir. Uh huh. I, if, uh, so the question was, what kind of knot to tie on a circle hook? I snell every circle hook. If it's, a, if it's a treble, if it's a J hook or a treble hook, I use a uni knot. But on a circle hook, it needs to be snelled. Say again? So anything that has a J hook in it would be a uni knot. You call that the Johnny Dukes? Johnny Dukes not. It's where I, when I was a kid, we had a party boat called the Johnny Dukes, and that's where I learned to tie that knot. And we were we were tying a uni knot 30 years before a uni knot was in existence. So, you know, there's several lures. You know, if I was going to have a lure, a typical cobia jig, cobia jigs were in. Um, there's a gentleman here in town who was kind of like the cobia god when I was a kid was Frank Helton. He kind of came up with the concept of cobia jigs. But if there's two things that will work other than just a regular cobia jig are some of your larger soft plastic swim baits and your Zuri um, twitch baits. They make excellent cobia choices too. And what's cool about a swim bait 
Not everybody can catch a fish on a true cobia jig. I used to have a friend of mine, he went two or three cobia seasons before he ever caught his first fish on a jig. He threw it a lot. And then when he finally caught his first one, he's over here doing this number. He's thinking about it as a jig. He's doing this. And finally, I just reached over there and grabbed the rod. He's trying to jig it, and it just kind of just twitched the jig, and the cobia ran up and ate it. As soon as he did that, he kind of got it that it's not that big a jig. But on a swim bait, anybody can catch one on a swim bait. Because all you got to do is throw it and reel it. That's all there is to it. Super easy. Um, what colors do you like? So as far as colors go, during the early part of the season, I, there's always the old fly fish term match the hatch. Um, there's a lot of squid around early in the cobia season, so pink is a really popular color for me. On a dirty water day, I like orange because it really shows out. On a day where it's super, super sunny, super, super clear, I like white because it has a good contrast when the fish is looking up at it. And then lastly, later in the cobia season, I like chartreuses and greens because there starts to be a lot of herring and cigar minnows and hardtails around. So it's kind of, I'm kind of matching what's going on. Um, and I had a, okay. So you're out of position. I do, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about chumming for cobias. So what we've talked about so far is very traditional cobia fishing, in, which is an extremely exciting way of catching cobias. And, now, and in a lot of the tournaments, you have to catch them that way. So... If you, if you win, then it says you'll have to get a polygraph and confirm that you didn't chum for them or catch them off of a fad or something like that. So there is a pretty cool thing behind catching them on a jig. Yeah. Or sight fishing for them anyway. And sight fishing is, I mean, it, to me, if we had cobia fishing that we had in the nine, 70s or the nine, in the 90s, I wouldn't fish for a whole lot else. I, I agree. Um, but in the last few years, we've all gotten more proficient at chumming for all different kinds of species, whether it be snappers or mahis or cobias or tunas. Cobias are an easy one to chum. And I know a lot of you will have, some of you will have boats that have a tower, that you can do a lot of traditional cobia fishing. But there's a lot of you who probably don't have a tower but want to go catch them. If you don't have a tower, this is probably actually a better option. Or putting a step ladder on the front of your boat and sending us a picture of it. <laughs> it will, and I'll make you famous sticking you on Facebook. Um, but you can come out here to a lot of the larger wrecks and chum for cobias. If you chum, they're gonna come, just like all the others, whether it's snappers or mahis or tunas. But it, yeah, it doesn't even matter though. So even if the cobia don't come, when you chum fish up to the surface like that, then, hey, guess what? You're standing over the side of the boat kind of picking which fish you wanna catch anyway, which to me is a hell of a lot more fun than dropping a 10 ounce sinker to the bottom and just waiting for a bite. Yeah. And reef or a wreck, either one. And the thing is, when you start chumming, yes, you're going to chum cobias to the boat, but you're going to chum snappers, you're going to chum mahis, you're going to chum some kings, there's going to be a lot of blackfin tunas around in the spring, there's going to be a lot of other options, you're going to catch a lot of other fish while you're catching, you know, having an opportunity to catch a cobia. Um, this is actually came, this little idea here came out of South Florida, and they call it a mahi basket. But it works great for mahis. It works great for cobias. You take a... No, it works great for remoras. <laughs> <laughs> it works good for sharks, too, if you want a shark to eat your chum basket. Did you catch... Is that how you caught your remoras today? I heard I you caught, caught three. three. Three remora on one sabiki rig. And didn't get them tangled at all. So, still not happy. <laughs> Would you just take a regular laundry basket and take a pool duel and zip tie it to it? Get you a five pound weight and some paracord. Put a five pound block of, ch take, put a five pound block of chum in there 
and a couple cigar minutes, throw it over, let it sit there for, you know, in the summertime, you want to catch mahis, put that out, put a box of chum in it, drive off bottom fish for an hour and come back and there's going to be mahis. Um, but it's a great way to chum for Kobe is also. Um, but, you know, five pound block of chum, a couple live cigar minas in there, let that sit for a little while. You'll be surprised what will come up off the bottom. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be something to catch. And I encourage everybody to try that. I mean, just, you're going out fishing anyway, before you just start dropping leads to the bottom, just even, like, like today, I took just some cut herring. Just that took a couple herring, tossed them over the side. I was like, let's just see what comes up. And I waited, I just watched them slowly drift down, not much, and I kind of looked at the guys on my boat and they were like, yeah, cool trick. And then I was like, well, just give it a second. I cut up another one and threw it in. And then just, and today where we were, it was triggers, but these huge triggers just came up underneath the boat. And I was like, see, you want those? And they were like, no, let's catch something bigger. So, but it was just, it's just a thing. Like if you're going out to a spot anyway to look for them, you might as well just see what you can get up on the surface and then throw something fun. Throw a top water plug at them and see what happens. You know what I'm talking about. And you know, if you're going to, yes, sir. Generally, I would stay, I would be inside of probably, it will work literally anywhere. But if you're targeting cobias, I think you probably want to be inside of three or four miles. And for everything else, I kind of look at my sonar, and if I'm in 80 feet of water, and I, I guess it's a visibility thing or scent or whatever senses they're using, but if I think they can see it, then I'll let it come up. And there's tricks that we can, we'll talk about during bottom fishing and all that about how to get that to go down and cloud up the water column or how to get them to come up. But today I was in like 65 feet of water and there were some marks about 40 feet down. And I was like, they look like they're coming up to check the boat out anyway, but let's just see. So it all depends on what I see on the sonar for other species. Um. But you know, if you're going to use the chum basket trick, you know, if this was the boat here, I'd put the chum basket down current of where we were going to be and be sitting here and throwing my other chum and working my chum back to that chum basket. Um, like Mark said, we're going to anchor it off there and we're going to start throwing more chum out and we're going to get the fish in between us and the chum basket there. For me, I like herring and I like ballyhoo for my, for my cut chum. Is that so, on a plate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my wife's plates too. That's probably my wife's cutting board. <laughs> so I'm she a little is. redneck, it's she all right. Is. Well, I'm if sure she is watching, she was right. She said, Mary's a saint and I agreed. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, uh, you've probably eaten jerk chicken off that <laughs> I probably plate. have. That's why I was asking. <laughs> Next time I'm over there, he, <laughs> oh, wait until you hear the meat processor story. <laughs> but that's, we'll save that for, well, that's a that's chum, a, that's, that's a chum related story. I guess it is a chum related story. You guys in a hurry. Um, yeah. but yeah, I like cut ballyhoo and cut. Uh, herring because I think they hold up better as cut chum than cigar minas and northern mackerel. Do you think I should tell them this? You want me to tell them yeah, this? Yeah, well, I think, I think they want to know. So I don't care what you're, you know, long time ago, I believe in scents on lures. And normally I actually forgot to bring um, Procure scent, but I normally put scent on all my lures. Well, long before they had scent. He's got, he's got some in his pocket. There you go. See, now this dude's a fisherman. He got proker in his pocket. <laughs> this stuff is awesome. Put it on trout lure, redfish lure, cobia lure, marlin lure. They make a bunch of different flavors. And if y'all want to go test, taste them all, that's fine. I really think they're all the same. I don't care which flavor you buy. They all work. They all stink. But I wanted, but 20 years ago, I wanted scent. Well, they didn't sell scent back then. 
So I took a tub of squid and I stuck it up on the roof and I left it up there for like a week and let it ferment and it was, I mean, it was kind of black and gooey. Well, I'm out in the garage and I have my wife's um, food processor and I'm blending it to a point that it can squirt to a squirt bottle. Well, she came out into the garage and she's like, what? The smell got her. It was because it permeated into the house and she's like, what are you doing out here? I'm like, I'm making chum. And then she knows that I had her food processor. Well, now I have a food processor, and my wife has a food processor. <laughs> hey, I've still been married for 37 years, so I'm doing something oh, yeah. right. You raised your hand. <laughs> we do it. I'm doing something right. See That's, the stuff you have. See the stuff you have to look forward to, Kayla. I'm so excited. I just can't hide. Oh my God, we're on American Idol. Um, so, chum balling is an, another, uh, you know, as far as just throwing regular chum, um, chum balling is an effective way of attracting cobias. Um, but the chumming thing, like I say, I think it's a very effective way for a lot of you that don't have a tower. And while you're chumming, you know, we're talking about, you know, put a chum basket out, you know, or at least if nothing else, hanging a chum bag off the side of the boat, cutting up some bait, some herring and stuff, and throwing that over. Um, don't forget about your live baits when you're chumming. Don't think it's all about just cut bait. Get a couple live baits. I probably wouldn't use an eel because they'll just tangle it up anyway. But get you a couple live baits, put them on some balloon rigs, and get them out there behind the boat too. Uh, you want to keep the, you know, you want the, the cobies are going to come up to the surface when you're chumming, so the balloon rigs work real good for that. Have you noticed that you have to catch all the small ones first to catch a big one? Absolutely. Okay. Good story about that is a couple, several, I mean, been back 20 years ago. Uh, the smaller cobias are typically a lot more aggressive than the larger ones, but it's the, um, this was back during the heyday of the 90s. But we, um, I was fishing with my buddies on the full pull, and we were tied with another boat here in town for the most fish over 50 that year. We had 47 over 50 during the Cobia tournament. And um, it was the last day of the tournament, and, you know, it's going down to the wire today. One of us is going to win. And we didn't know it, but the boat we were competing against had actually broken down and couldn't leave the dock that day. Um, so all we had to do was catch one. Because <laughs> Tim well, filled their gas tank with sand. Well, we're running down the beach, and we're in the tower, but we're running down. We're, we're on our way down to Navarre to start cobia fishing. And I look in shore, and there's a water of about seven or ten cobias. And two of them are well over 50, and I'm like, Andy, Andy, right there. And sure enough, we pull in there, and we see them all. And, the little ones are all around. The, the big fish are in the middle. The little ones are all around him. I said, well, let's just throw a test bait. And I threw a lure out in front of him. I start working my lure, and three or four of the little ones come running after it. And I reel the lure in again and throw it again. Same thing, the little ones run after it. And I looked at Annie. I was like, I think we're going to have to hook them all. And we had about three or four guys were supposed to go fishing with us that day. And it, and then, but the forecast turned out it was going to be really rough. And they kind of bailed at the last minute. And it was just the two of us. And then it turned out to be a really nice day. Well, so here we are, two of us in the boat, and there's seven or eight Kobe is swimming around. And so I start getting, Andy's driving the boat, and I'm getting everything staged up. So we got rods on the top layer of the tower, rods on the middle station, and the rods down in the deck. So I'm reel up, take a live bait, throw it out, hook one of the little Kobe's, hook it to the thing, walk it down, stick it in a rod holder, come back. He's still driving the boat, keeping the fish all perfectly right there behind us grab another lab bait, hook another one. We'll come, we ended up hooking, we had like seven or eight cobias on at one time. And Charles Morgan from Harbor Docks comes driving by us and he's like, y'all just gonna catch everything that swims? I'm like, we're gonna catch those two. Well, we got our two out of the 50 right there um, to put us over the top, but we did have to hook every single one of them. Um, we let all the little guys go, but we hooked them all. So, yeah, that's the that's my favorite part of fishing right there. 
Have you guys ever gaffed a cobia before? Is anyone? Yeah. It's awesome, right? So, cobias are very, I want to warn you about these guys. They are, while they're fun to catch, great to eat, everything else, they are very, they can be very dangerous. Gaffing a cobia, you know, more, some smaller species of stuff, we can just kind of grab them, stick them in the boat, whatever. Cobias. Anglers in the back, the anglers on the side of the boat, we got a driver driving, gaff man's in the back corner. The angler's gonna pull the fish up. The gaff man is definitely not gonna go underneath. The cobia's belly is very soft. We're gonna go over the top of the back of the cobia and try to hit him right here where the meat meets his head. He's gonna come in the boat. You're over the rail. The fish box is already open. Cobia goes in the fish box, turn him off, shut the lid. Sit on the lid. Sit on the Have lid. Have a friend sit on it with you. Um, uh, one of the girls that used to work, that are, still works for us over in our Navarre store, we're in his little boat one day, and, he, and he's walking one up to the front, and it falls off the gaff. Well, there's about five or six little tines across the back of a cobia. Well, he's got scars all the way down his leg where it fell off the gaff, and those tines just cut him to pieces. Cobias will hurt you if you're not careful. Um, if you're going to tournament fish, I was... Um, back when I was the waymaster for um, the Hogs Breath Cobia tournament, we had one of our local boats, you know, lose the Cobia tournament that year because of gaff and cobias. If you're if you're serious about tournament fishing cobias, you need to learn how to net cobias. Um, most fish will lose about 10% weight in the first hour after you gaff them. Cobias can actually be worse. Um, but learning how to learning how to net one. See, and I put this picture in there because this is absolutely wrong. Best way to lose a big fish. Gaff that fish in the belly and you go to pick him up over the side of the rail. And he's going to do this number and it just rips, boom, in the water, lines broke, fish gone. But that's, that's just a perfect shot of what not to do perfect shot of what to do. Questions? Everybody's a Kobe fishing expert now? Um, you know, like you said, this time of year, there's a tremendous amount of Spanish mackerel around. Um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but because we've already run pretty, we're, we're already moving, we have moved on real good here. The little straw rigs, um, some Yozuri crystal minnows are some of the best things to troll for Spanish. Once you troll and you catch one or two trolling, a GI jig or a gotcha lure makes an awesome something to throw at Spanish. Um, you know, fishing's going to heat up real fast this year. The water temperatures are already well into the 70s. Normally, normally when we're literally looking for the perfect conditions for cobia fishing, a lot of times our water temperatures will drop into the low 60s or high 50s in the winter. And we really look to say, okay, when the water temperature gets to be 63, that's when we're going to go catch the first cobia. Well, the water temperature, I don't think ever got to 63. It's well into the 70s now. The last two days, I know multiple boats that have caught not little bitty mahis, not big mahis, but just respectable mahis within a couple miles of the beach. That's awesome. The Panama City Pier caught their first king mackerel a week ago today. Our pier caught their first king mackerel Thursday. Our pier caught a bunch of king mackerel on Saturday. The first king mackerel our pier did catch was 40.4 pounds. Um, and they caught several over 30 on Saturday. Uh, the blackfin tuna have been around for quite some time, pretty much most since the first of the year. And the pompano along the beach have been excellent the last 10 days. So. 
I think we're going to have a very, very early season for almost everything. Um, so you got plenty of opportunities to pick pretty much what you want to go catch right now. Um, you know, our next seminar is going to be on Mark's favorite subject will be slow pitch jigging. Oh, sweet. That's the only thing um, we did today. We dropped jigs. Only. Um, so I'll, the next seminar, I'll just sit here and shut up and let Mark talk. Um, nah, I can't do that. We can't do that? Yes. First keeper. The first, yeah. Yeah, first, first fish is the keeper. And so they've actually caught, I know of probably six, eight, maybe even 10 that have been caught bottom fishing. Those don't count. It's the oh. first cobia caught traditional cobia fishing. Or fads. Those don't count either. Yeah. But the, you know, it's, I very rarely catch a cobia 80 miles offshore at a fad. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So do we have all this? Is all this all giveaway? It? Should we let the girls do it? Girls are going to be busy for a little bit. They got a lot of stuff for y'all. They got a lot of free goodies. While they're doing that, I'm going to come around and pass out some cards. These are $20 off a $50 purchase at the store. Um, just kind of a little thank you for coming in. Okay. I heard you say you like that hat, so I hope you win it. So these are, I don't know if you guys have seen these awesome hats from Legendary, but they are super cool, lots of different colors. Dylan, who do we have? We have Ela. Yes, whatever that was. <laughs> Good job. Woo! All right. Let's go for a purple beach towel. Very cool, legendary marine. You've got all of your fun beach fish here. This is gonna be Steve Benedict. Do we have a Steve Benedict? No, all right, moving on. Who we got? Sailor Harrison. Sailor Harrison, all right, Sailor. I bet you want your procure back too, huh, honey? <laughs> No, that's mine now. <laughs> All right, let's go with the Navy Legendary Marine hat here. Deb Lubis? Lucas? Cool. Thank you. All much. right. Congratulations. All right, next, let's go with one of the uh, Pelagic Sun Shields here. We have Braden Teague. You guys must have been sitting in the lucky section over there. All right. Do you want to do one of the mats, or how are you going to do those? Or you keep going with this? What do you want to do? Yeah, let's go for mats. So for this set here, Fallon, do you want to tell us a little bit about these mats too? Sure. This is a marine mat brand here that we do at Calypso Marine Decks, and we have a 36-inch ruler, and we also have a 45-quart ice chest cooler. Oops. Okay. All right. And let's see who's the winner. Winner. Aaron. Hendricks. Hendricks. Aaron uh, Hendricks. All right, Aaron. Good job. You, you have to have some patience with us pronouncing <laughs> some of y'all names. <laughs> all right, all let's right. go, you. All right. Let's do another pelagic sun shield here. We have bum bum bum. Oh Lord. M Rain. M Rain, maybe? Yep. I, I'm going to bring it right to you. All right. Going to go again? Yeah, we're going to go with the Marine Mat Cooler Top 45 quart with a ruler in it. And the winner is. Doo -doo -doo. Tim Tran. Ooh. Oh, good nice. job. See, now this is the lucky section. I know. It keeps on moving around. All 
right. All right. I'm gonna do another uh, beach towel from Legendary. We have Captain Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do with the, all right. Fallon, what if we do a red legendary marine hat with a black pelagic sun shield? Let's do these two together. All right, so we have here Louise Pohl. Oh, perfect. Oh, Fallon, I've been eyeballing this one myself. I like this color. I love this one. This one is this Kayla? Is that what? You're I know. So it's a helm pad, and the winner is Walter Real. All right, perfect. Congratulations. Okay, next up, let's go with another pelagic sun shield here, Mark Fellins. Feelings? Ooh, nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. I hope you guys are proud that almost everybody's winning today. We've got lots of prizes. <laughs> uh, so, Robert Forster, you want to do another Pelagic Sun Shield? Oh, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Fallon, you want to do one of these with maybe a Mahi? Yes. Oh, look at this set. Okay. This is going to be. <laughs> it's the it's the pizza and the prizes at the end. Okay, Travis Spence. Nice. Oh, nice, Travis. Nice. All right, so we've got three left, guys. Cross your fingers. Let's go with a moo a, a, moo, a blue <laughs> a blue pelagic sun shield. Um, Chastity, Chastity uh, Burton. Oh, that matches too. Perfect. Yep. All right, now let's go with the Mahi. This is Daniel. Same last name as before. Hut. All right, <laughs> you're going to have to pronounce that name for me. Hargonis. Congratulations. All right, last one. All right, one. last one. Ryan Hillstrom. All right, all the way in the back. All right, congratulations. Congratulations. Awesome. Tim, you're going to go for that. <laughs> well, thank everybody for coming out tonight. You know, next month's seminar will be Slow Pitch Jigging. So uh, that will be the first Tuesday of April. But anyway, thanks for coming tonight.